we're going to start it here. Okay, so it's going to get the recording is starting here. And we'll let people in and we'll get started here in just a few minutes. Okay. I'm going to get this going live on Facebook here as well. Okay, I think we're live on Facebook. We should be recording here. It's 5.30. We've got uh, people rolling in here yet, but I think we'll go ahead and, and uh, get started because we got a lot of good stuff to cover here uh, uh, this evening. So thank you everybody for joining us uh, for our Green Cover webinar uh, here on Tuesday evening. We've got uh, we got a couple of guests that, that uh, I specifically, when we started laying out our, our panelists to who we'd like to get, uh, I specifically had these folks on my list because always been fascinated with uh, what they've done and how they've contributed in, in this composting system that, that we're gonna be talking about uh, is, is really fascinating. But what makes it great is it's so applicable to everybody. And, and, and we'll get into that here in a little bit. But uh, our guests this evening, well, well, first of all, I gotta take care of a few details. So we are recording this. Uh, it will be available on, uh, it will be available out on YouTube. Uh, everybody else who's on here, except myself and, and uh, our, our panelists, uh, you're already muted, so you don't have to worry about muting yourself. Unfortunately, that means you can't talk. Uh, so I, I was telling uh, Wave 10 that I've got seven kids, and this would be a great feature to have you know, at the dinner table, just to have everybody automatically muted unless I point to you, but it doesn't happen <laughs> that way. Uh, but we do encourage you, we want you to ask questions. Uh, so you've got two ways you can do that. You can do it through the chat bar uh, and you can just uh, chat a question. You can also use the Q&A tool at the bottom of your screen there. If you're watching on Facebook, uh, just uh, make a Facebook comment. I will try to remember to check that. I'm not as good as Noah is at checking those Facebook comments, uh, but you've got multiple ways that you can ask questions. Uh, so our, our guest tonight, uh, Dr. David Johnson uh, and his wife, uh, Wave Chin. And uh, they are the, the, the creators of the Johnson Sioux composting method, which is gonna be the topic of our conversation here tonight. Uh, they are both at New Mexico State University and I'll let them give a little bit more of their, their background. And uh, I, was, I was talking to them a little bit uh, earlier about how they met. I won't, I won't divulge your secrets there, uh, <laughs> but uh, uh, great background, uh, but like I say have made made a huge contribution to the regenerative ag movement, to the soil health movement, uh, largely because the process that they've developed is not something that requires this huge amount of equipment. And that's one of the things I really appreciated about it. And so what we're gonna do is I'm, we're gonna just kind of have a little bit of a discussion. I kind of came up with questions that I wanted to have answered. When you're the host, you can be a little selfish. So I basically wrote down the things that I wanted to know and so we're going to discuss those first. We've got a few slides that will kind of help back up some of the, uh, the things that they're talking about. And in the course of the, the discussion that we'll have together, the three of us here, uh, hopefully it will generate some additional questions from you folks out in the audience. Uh, we would encourage you again, just to put those in the Q&A or in, in the uh, chat box. So uh, uh, David and Wave Chin, why don't, first of all, just give us a little bit of an introduction, a little bit of a background on uh, you know, where you're at, where you're at right now, some of the things that you've done, and then we'll jump right into these questions. You didn't tell me you're gonna start out with the toughest question first. <laughs> <laughs> well, uh, I'm a molecular biologist at New Mexico State University. And I was really a returning student, I didn't, I've been in the private sector for about 30 years, had my own construction business and 
I decided to make a change for the other hopefully 30 years. And uh, I went back to school at 51 and got into different uh, programs at the university. And a lot of this was just serendipitous. The, the path that I took, the, the things I studied, everything just kind of fell in place in front of me. And we ended up uh, working at soul biology and the influence of this, for lack of a better word, compost on how to regenerate the soil microbiome. And all of this came about because of Wei Chin, actually. <laughs> I had a project EA that said do something good with dairy manure. And of course me and the traditional methods, I would go out and make a compost pile and turn it and doing it in a windrow fashion. And I came in with dirty clothes and that was not gonna work. <laughs> uh, she said we're going to do something different. <laughs> I think everybody can agree with me that we don't mind work hard. Most people um, uh, attending this webinar probably are hardworking farmers. And uh, um, but work smart, it's okay. And uh, so we kind of put our heads together by understanding the principles of the um, of compost, understanding that they need uh, ample amount of air being aerobic and a certain percentage of water. And then how do we keep those microbes happy? Mm -hmm. And uh, um, so we kind of put our heads together and then came up with this, eventually came up with this end product that everybody is um, aware of. Yeah, no, that's great. So Wei Chin, what, what, is, what is your background? Are you a biologist as well? No, no, and I think this is the greatest part because anybody on this webinar can do it as mm -hmm. long as you're curious and as long as you're willing to learn. Okay. And uh, because I am not associated with any university. And as a matter of fact, my day job is a real estate broker. And uh, being that David is in this regenerative ag research that does not have a whole bunch of funding, uh, I did not read the marriage license very well, and uh, I uh, did not read the fine print, and I, I became the unpaid um, volunteer research assistant. So, I hope that's just true. She's actually a geek, okay? Yes. <laughs> she looked at all kinds of papers, reading all kinds of scientific journals all the time, so. <laughs> I, 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 I'm a closet geek, and so I have, I'm coming out of the closet now, but... Um, <sighs> But, you know, I think a lot of people out there are that way, you know, yeah. that they are curious. And, and that is the great thing. And that's a great point. I'm glad you brought that up because you don't need a lot of formal training in order to learn a lot because there are so many resources out there. I often talk about the University of YouTube kind of jokingly because, <laughs> you know, that's there's a tremendous amount of education occurring there. This this video will go to the University of YouTube for somebody to, to watch down the road as well. So I, I appreciate that perspective that you bring and, and the fact that you, you just have to be a good thinker. And a lot of the, a lot of your process here is, is pretty much common sense. Uh, and, and I really, I really appreciate that. So I'm going to share my screen so we can start bringing up these slides here. Okay. Do I have the right thing up there? You've got it. Okay, great. Great. So, uh, I'm just going to ask you the first question here, and like I say, we're just going to go through the the questions, and we'll kind of talk about uh, some of these different things and and lay the groundwork for uh, uh, the discussion here. So, first of all, you know when when I think about what you've done, the word compost scares a lot of people as it gives the picture of you know lots of work, you know these these big machines turning all this compost, expensive equipment to do it. Tell us a little bit about how your method is so different and how it's achievable for just about anybody to do. I guess the biggest thing about our method is uh, you don't have all the equipment, as you say. It's, you don't turn it. It's done in a bioreactor. I have a picture here in about three slides. Yeah, um, let, me just, let me just go to that. Okay. There we go. There. Uh, there's a link to how to make it if you like, but it's, it's pretty simple. Uh, there's three things that you want to observe in this. Um, you want to keep it at 70% moisture content. You want to keep it aerobic and the uh, pipe in the center 
are there for 24 hours. They're just a form as you fill the bioreactor. I guess back up one, I guess the timer is gonna take over here. Uh, but the pipe are only in there for 24 hours and you pull them out and those holes will stay there and you'll have air flowing up through the center. So you're mm -hmm. never more than a, a six to eight inches away from ambient air. So it stays aerobic. So at the 70% moisture content and aerobic, and also no turning, which is the nicest thing about this. Um, but it takes about a year to mature. We see a complete shift in the population of the microbes. Uh, we see a four times increase in the diversity. The microbes that are there at the beginning don't show up in the test at the end. So it's, it's, it's a maturation process that takes about a year. And the compost, when you're done, it, it all collapses in on itself. And it looks like a deep, dark, decadent, rich chocolate cake. And uh, it slices like a cake. And when you put it in your hands and squeeze it, it's like clay. It, it'll ooze between your fingers. But uh, what you see in this, when you look at it under a microscope, is a significant number of fungal spores and bacteria. Most important here are the fungal spores to, to restore that fungal community to your yeah. soil systems. Yeah, and would, you, and would you say that's probably one of the biggest differences between Johnson Sioux compost and traditional compost is that fungal component? Yes, um, but it's seen that there's spores. At the application rate we use, this, this reactor takes about 2,000 pounds of material to fill wet material you end up with about 700 pounds. But that 700 pounds will treat about 350 acres. It goes a long way. And That's why I always emphasize that allowing it to mature and make sure the quality control is there is very important. If you are inoculating at such a small rate, you know, for two pounds per acre, making extract out of those two pounds to in inoculate uh, your land while you're planting and make sure there are sea contact. Mm -hmm. So that, that's very important because if you don't have a high quality in product, it will take a lot more than two pounds per acre. So well, let well, me good, reiterate one is, thing. Yeah, go ahead. We do use worms. The worms are put in there as soon as the temperature of the pile gets below 80 degrees and they are key to the uh, quality of the end product. So it is a vermicompost. Mm -hmm. uh, uh, are you using like the, what the red wigglers or what are you putting in there for worms? Yeah, yeah. we go to Walmart and we'll buy uh, about a hundred worms and throw them at the top. And by the end of the process, it's chock full of baby worms. Mm. And they, they, if you've done it right, they processed all the way to the edge of the material and you see all the worm trails going around. Yeah. And if Anybody want to write this down if they are interested in doing this, make sure you, you don't allow this pile to dry it out. If you can remember, which neither one of us can remember to water it regularly. So that's why we put a timer to irrigate it. And uh, so the, in the video also has the how to set up uh, irrigation. Don't let it dry it out and don't let it freeze. Mm. This is a biological incubator. So there are a lot of organisms, they, they like certain condition to, to live and to flourish. And just like us, we have certain resiliencies, but if, we, if you take your kid outside in the middle of winter, when it's freezing temperature, that kid is not gonna last too long. And so you have to think that's why the biological part comes in here. Always think about biology. So don't let it freeze and don't let it dry out. So like, like, in the, like in the heat of the summer and you guys have hot summers there for sure. Is that every day? Are you watering every day? But as it yeah. cools off, you don't have to do quite every day or how do you, how do you gauge that? Since we're in the desert, I irrigate about uh, a minute a day. I put out about a gallon and a half of water. I used, I've changed it to a, uh, what they call a spot spit sprayer. And I use six of them on there and it does a fine mist over the top for one minute. And that just settles through the pile and it keeps it wet. If you're in a cooler climate or more damp climate, you don't have to do it that often. Just 
check it every once in a while. What you want to see on that material is a sheen of water when you pull it out of there. You want to make sure, because that's the, that enables all the microbes to transit on all the or organic matter and break it down. Mm -hmm. And based, based on the literature, worms and the fungi, they like that 70% or yep. relatively 70% moisture content. So if you stray too far away from it, gets too dry, they don't do well. If it's too high that you are reaching the 100% saturation, it becomes suffocating. Yeah. So you ended up with anaerobic condition because mm -hmm. the air did not infiltrate. Yeah, no. When you use this, it's a two pound per acre rate. What we see and analyzing that extract, because we make an extract out of it, is we're putting out about 80 million bacteria per square foot and 10 million fungal spores per square foot on that field. So that's, this is part of regenerating that microbial community. If you don't have it, you know, some people, they may have fields that are very healthy and this, this they probably don't need this, but if you have a field that you've pretty much broken, uh, we see this goes a long way to kickstarting that system and regenerating that microbial community. And you're getting uh, free living nitrogen fixing bacteria into it. You're getting phosphorus solubilizers. You're getting uh, carbon and nitrogen cycling. You're getting uh, metal oxidation from the microbes. You're getting plant pheromones. Uh, and also you're getting uh, situations where they would start to work together as a community and situation we call quorum sensing, where mm -hmm. it takes a community of bacteria to work together to express genes to uh, have certain operations go on. Yeah, it, it, and those numbers are fascinating because you're talking about 90 million organisms per square foot times 43,560 square feet <laughs> in an acre. And you're pulling that out of two pounds of this compost. so. I mean, that, that, that tells us how concentrated it is. And, and I would love to go into more of the details of how you build this bioreactor, but like, like I discussed with you before, I don't think we have time for that. And there's really good resources online. So, so folks that are watching this, either live or on, on YouTube later, there's a link, or you can just go to YouTube and, and search for this topic. There's really good videos on there of how to build the bioreactor, how to set it up, how to do all of that, even how to pull the, uh, the extract out. And, and if we have time at the end, we can discuss that a little bit more. Uh, but I, I do want to spend our time kind of focusing more on the process and, and why you did this. So I want to just give you the opportunity uh, to, to tell us how you developed the, the beam process. And if you hear him talking about beam, it's biologically enhanced agricultural management, as you can see on the slide there. Uh, but David, tell us a little bit about how you came up with this and, and why it's important. And then we can go into a few details of, of how you've actually seen it really change things for people using it. Okay. Well, I really backed into this, <laughs> literally. Uh, but, you know, I was, I was an MPK junkie. You know, I, I spent my whole life figuring all the numbers and getting you know, figure out what to put out on the field fertilizer wise. And uh, this just kind of came out of my research, uh, out of the compost research, looking at <clears throat> the influence of that compost that we made in this system, how it affected plant growth. And what I started to see is we, we didn't need fertilizers. Mm -hmm. You know, we were able to restore or regenerate that microbial community in that system. And we call it a BEAM, or Biologically Enhanced Agricultural Management. Looking at agriculture from a different perspective, not of uh, all these amendments that you have to put on, because we saw the damage, we, we're seeing the damage from that. And we're, we're seeing that we're losing fertility in these soils. So it's just a different way to look at how to grow a plant and start to look at how nature did it. Yeah, in one of his earlier research, um, trial, what he did was that he, when he analyzed and he tried to see that if the M, P, and K um, influence the growth on the plants and also the uh, organic matter. And then just because he's a molecular biologist, so he throw in the, um, the, soil, the fungal to bacteria ratio. 
And to his surprise, you should see him, he come running home with this, with his eyes wide and said, you wouldn't believe this. And I went back and calculated like a three, four times, make sure I was not mistaken that MPK did not correlate. And to his even bigger surprise, organic matter did not correlate, but fungal to bacteria ratio correlate. And so, so from that point, he thought, well, I need to do a further research and then see why. And so that's the, the, the subsequent research design to confirm that observation. And that's why we often tell people that when you have something that it might appear to be anomaly, investigate it because that observation might lead you down a path that is to your surprise, it's gonna be very beneficial. Probably 98% of the greatest discoveries on this planet are all serendipitous. Mm -hmm. So pay attention to those anomalies. <laughs> so you're saying that the organic matter content didn't matter nearly as much as the fungal to bacterial ratio. It, it didn't have any correlation at all to plant growth. It was, wow. Uh, I, was, I was surprised too. I expected to be organic matter to be a predictor. And I just threw in the fungal to bacterial ratio because I'd gone and seen Elaine Ingham and I'd taken her class and just observing, I wanted to see, okay, if what she was saying was true. Mm -hmm. And it showed to be very good correlation. Yeah. And, but we're not saying that organic matter is not important, but what, what the research result tell us is that if you don't have life in your soil, the organic matter is not going to be as beneficial as what you think. And yeah. just like with human society that you can have a big room full of money like on the pallet, but if you don't have right people to utilize the resource and to make, to invest or use that to build something and then in, and to, to generate even more income. It's just a pile, a pallet full of uh, paper or material. <clears throat> so that's comes, that comes back to being biologically enhanced agricultural management is that when you do the right type of management, and inoculating with biology, or it can be making this type of compost, or it can be uh, if you have rangeland and properly uh, utilize the cow for the rotation and, and you know the proper management is very important. Just like biologically enhanced agricultural management, it's so important to incorporate the cover crop because they feed the microbes. So you have to keep the cycle of life going. And it's the efficiency in the cycle going to enhance your system and to have a really well working being. Yeah. It, it, it's a biologically functional carbon yeah. is what we're shooting for. You, we've seen soils four, five, six percent soil organic matter and they're dead. And people are still throwing, having to throw fertilizers to grow beneath it. But if, if you have a functional carbon, if all the biology working, um, it all works together to improve the plant's ability to photosynthesize. The plant sends down more exudates to feed those microbes. Those microbes increase in population, increase the ability to extract the elemental nutrients out of the soil parent material or fix nitrogen from the atmosphere. It's a positive feedback loop that you're trying to rebuild in this system. And we're just, as she was saying, mimicking what happened in the Great Plains, mm -hmm. trying to restore that biology that was there and with the six foot plus deep soil carbon profiles and their productivity. It's, we're just trying to mimic that in agriculture. As, as a farmer, you are at the driver's seat to allow the positive feedback loop or negative feedback loop. And so if you go on the positive feedback loop, then you increasing the efficiency, then you don't need all the amendment and then you can have a productiveness on your farm 
by utilizing the life on your farm and the sunshine that you get. And then you also get to hold on to the water that, that you get as well. Okay. Yeah, and so you talked a lot about microbes and I know you probably wanted to talk about this slide just a little bit about some of the different microbes and how they're that backbone of the system. Well, it's, it's all perspective of how we look at this planet. And if you look deep enough, you'll see that microbes are the backbone of every organism, every multi-celled organism on this planet. And not one organism can survive without its community of microbes. And soils are the same. And we have to you know, adopt that perspective in our farming. You know, Whatever we do, we want to be thinking, okay, what are we doing to the microbial community? Are we benefiting it? Or are we setting it back? Mm, yeah, I, I told somebody the other day in one of the talks that I did, we don't have all the answers, but I think we're asking the right question because the question is, anytime that we wanna add something to the system, the question should be, how will this affect the biology? Yeah. I say, I don't know the answer to it, but at least, at least well, we're asking the right questions. You're not alone. You know, a lot of this is way above our pay grade. <laughs> and uh, to understand the dynamics of nature, you know, she's got multiple ways to do this, multiple pathways. Uh, if there's one pathway is not working, she can go another. Mm -hmm. But keeping these organisms fed, either with a cover crop or a commodity crop, is essential. You have to have that carbon flow, <coughs> excuse me, into the soil to support those organisms, to help them live and thrive, uh, increase in population, increase in the structure, changing from bacterial dominant to fungal dominant, increasing in diversity, and all those work together to change that biological functionality. Yeah, living roots is so essential in this system of to, to grow your microbes, enable for the microbes to feed back to the, your plants. So that's why above ground, how you manage by minimizing your disturbance, may it be chemical, biological, or mechanical. So if you minimize all those disturbance, allowing the plants and with the, those living roots to work with the microbe, to create their synergy, to produce for you. Mm -hmm. and, and that's why also that if you disturb too much by, by extracting above ground biomass too much, then it takes away those, uh, ca the capability of the roots able to go down and then feed those microbes and they cannot regenerate. So then if when you extract too much, that's when you start going into negative feedback loop. That's when you start seeing the compaction of soil as well. So that, that it's all interconnected as a system. Yeah, and I think, I was just going here, I think you have, you talked about the feedback loop. I think, did we have a slide talking yeah, about? I think it's about third from the end. But, but also, you, there it is. You need to consider, uh, it has to be multi-species covers. And as she's saying, you need to leave part of this. Nature has a golden ratio. If you look at how much corn you pull off of a field, it's 40%. If you look at how much cotton you pull off of a field, it's 40%. Of the plant. Yeah, if you look at um, almost every a wheat crop, oats, almost all of those, nature allows 40%, but she expects that other 60% to remain to keep that system built up and surviving. And as you can see here, just the photosynthesis, you know, photosynthates from the photosynthesis go down to feed that soil microbiome. The microbiome can then extract elemental nutrients from the soil parent material and or fix nitrogen from the atmosphere. In each cycle on this, it, it's a positive feedback loop. You increase your photosynthetic capacity of these soils. Uh, we've seen a change from uh, about 500 grams of dry biomass per square meter to 3000 grams of dry biomass per square meter capability once you bring the soil microbiome back and have it functioning with the cover crops. So it's, you see the soil microbiome population increase, again, on another cycle, enables it to extract more nutrients or fix more nitrogen. But we also notice soil respiration goes down. You get a more efficient system. So this really works for carbon sequestration. 
Uh, it's going to be a, a great tool. Farmers will be able to be more profitable. They'll be able to restore and regenerate their soils so they can pass this on to their children and not pass a problem from what they have now. Allowing the carbon in the right place have the right resident time. And that's important when you're looking at this cycle here. And another thing about it is um, I have think deep and hard about the soil health principle that they've been teaching. And those are all very good principles. But you know how it goes that the, the devil is always in the details. For example, when I talk about not over extract, having the livestock available for you to improve the soil is really, really great. But then if you don't manage that livestock and you overgraze or allow them to get on the land at the wrong time, then you're extracting or you just, you are, you're damaging again. So be mindful about when you are applying those uh, soil health principles. Yeah, and I, I, I think I've, I've heard you eloquently explain almost every one of those principles in this context. So would it be fair to say that when you're applying the soil health principles properly, you, you get this positive feedback loop and indeed the rich do get richer when it comes to the soil. But when you misapply them or you don't apply them or you just ignore them, you get the negative feedback loop and the poor get poorer again yeah. when it comes to the soil. Would you say that's accurate? Yeah, oh, definitely. Oh yeah, think about that if you bring in a herd of cattle onto your pasture and thinking you are inoculating your soil and, and doing all the right things, you know, with a hoof action, saliva, dung, urine, yes, that's great, but you leave them there too long. You graze it down to like a putting green and that is overly extract. You're going downhill. And, and you're going downhill, that plant, those forests, they're not going to recover. And, and then the next year is going to be even worse. And that's that negative feedback loop you're talking about. Yeah. 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 And uh, as you bring that carbon back, you're building up that pool of nitrogen in that system. So you don't need the fertilizers. You only get to that point. You know, it takes a, f a few years, but we're seeing that uh, we can completely do without nitrogen fertilizers in these systems and still have as good a productivity or better productivity and be much more profitable. Yeah. And, and I think we've got a slide that talks about that. And I'll go to that here in just a second. But I, I, people ask this question a lot. And in fact, somebody may have already be asking it here. I'll maybe beat them to the punch. But uh, I've heard people ask, you know, like Dr. Christine Jones and others, this question too. How, how like use, you know, if you implement the, the principles of soil health, you start inoculating your soil with uh, this compost extract, how much can you cut back on your fertility in that first year? And that's a big question right now because of the huge expense in it. Oh, a lot yeah. of people are asking how, how much do you feel comfortable? I, I'm sure there's a lot of, a lot of things that play into that, but I know that's a question that people have on their mind. Yeah, back up to that one with the half circle on it. Whoops. No, keep going back. It's a little more. A little more. There. We started an experiment in Wilcox, Arizona with Howard Buffett, looking at um, just employing beam on one treatment on the left. At this point, we just called the inoculation of the compost extract as beam, right? Okay. Okay. And then a, a beam plus 15% nitrogen, about 38 units of nitrogen per acre applied. And then the conventional, and this is what the uh, crop consultant said, they needed 256 pounds of nitrogen to get 250 uh, bushels of corn. And so uh, this is in 2019, go ahead and go next slide. Uh, this was our cover crop in 2020. And what we started to do is roll this cover crop down and then plant into it. Uh, and we were only using the beam on the, uh, the commodity crop. Not, he didn't have the equipment to inoculate the cover crop seed. So we were limited to just applying the extract on the uh, corn as we planted it 
you know, spraying an extract in, making sure it got seed and soil contact uh, as we planted the corn. And, and, and two gallons an acre? At two gallons per acre, or two pounds, two, two pounds per, per uh, compost per acre. And we mixed it into um, about 20 gallons of water. So we had a 20 gallon uh, of extract solution per acre applied, but it's okay. only, two, only two pounds of the compost in that 20 gallons. Okay. And go to the next slide. Uh, this was, he didn't have to spray any for uh, weed control on this corn crop with the cover crop that we got in. We saw the check, go ahead, go to that next one if you want. Uh, we saw a change from 2019 to 21, 21 uh, from fungal bacterial ratio of 0.007 to 1.43. And when we talk about fungal to bacterial ratio, we're talking about the mass, not species. Because if you're talking about species, the, the bacteria still have a, a larger number of species but when you look at the uh, mass uh, ratio, fungal to bacteria ratio that um, fungi has um, increased quite a bit compared to the bacterial mass that had reduced. This, this farm had been no-till for the four to five years previous to this. And you can see just with no-till, he was still very bacterial dominant, extremely bacterial dominant. But to make that change in two years, uh, to go from 0 0.007 to 1.43 was pretty dramatic. We did not expect this. <laughs> that, that, I, I, I don't know if people can appreciate how huge those numbers are. <clears throat> I've looked at a lot of PLFA tests and, and most of them, if you get a 0.1, you gotta feel like you're doing pretty good because one to one is, is you know, you just almost never see that. 1.43 to one is incredible. Let me, before we go to the next slide, let me ask you this. I'm just going to go back. How much of, how much of it, because you got a huge amount of carbon here and that's going to be the food source for the, for the fungus that you're putting on. Exactly. How much do you think that how, I mean, it's, it's a combination, right? It's, it's the carbon, the huge carbon source plus the organisms to break it down. But if you put that out on bare soil, I'm guessing you wouldn't have got those numbers? Uh, I don't think so. Um, there's so much benefit from having that cover, keeping the soil temperature down, keeping the weed pressure down, providing forage for the fungi and the earthworms. Uh, the earthworms are key in this. This soil was so compacted when we started. The first cover crop we grew didn't grow into the ground. It pushed the ground up. And we had like corrugated field. When you drove over, it was just like driving over a corrugation. So it uh, was very compacted. All of that has changed now. When you walk on this field, uh, the farm manager was walking, says, you can feel the give in it. It's starting to get some resilience and, and tilt. So it's completely changed uh, the yeah. way he looks at farming. And he was comparing his conventional corn to the corn with the beam and the beam plus 15%. And he says, why am I putting nitrogen in? <laughs> because yeah, I'll show you the, the crop productivity here, I think, um, the, after this slide. No, nope. uh, this was our change in soil carbon. Yeah. Uh, as I was saying, four to five years of no-till before, his carbon increase rate was 0.029% per year, about 1.26 tons of carbon per hectare per year. Once we started introducing the, the cover crops, the beam approach, uh, we changed to 0.26%. That was 11.32 tons of carbon per hectare per year, which is a phenomenal rate. Most scientists have seen nothing over a half to one ton of carbon per hectare per year. But with the biology, with the right biology, this system begins to function again. Yeah, and, and, you know, as, as people start talking about getting into carbon programs, you know, that, that's a huge payout there. If you're getting paid on actual carbon fixed and they're actually doing, you know, reliable measurements, that, that's a huge number. Yeah, you, you figure this in Australia, they're getting paid about, what was it, $25 a ton? So that they were making more with carbon than they were with the crop. 
but but that's that's gravy for this. But what happened here is you're changing the system how it's functioning for your arm. And there was a question about the compost. That two pounds of compost is at seventy percent moisture content. Mm -hmm. It's not dry, so. It's even less than two pounds when you figure out the actual weight of the compost. Yeah, yeah. So two 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 pounds at seventy percent moisture. Right, right. Yeah. yeah. So let's see. Do you, do you have a slide here on yields? Then. Oh yeah. Here's uh, this was a corn and pinto bean rotation. Rotation. And our first year, our, our transition, uh, we matched the productivity of conventional with the bean plus fifteen percent. And we only lost about 6.6% .6 of the productivity with the beam only, with no nitrogen. But when you did the final analysis of the profit, the beam plus 15% was $122 an acre more profitable than conventional and $86 an acre more profitable in the beam. When he talked about conventional, he's talking about the full recommended rate of nitrogen application. The follow up pinto bean crop, uh, you can look both the beam plus 15% and being outperformed the conventional. And the conventional actually lost money that year. But the beam plus 15 and beam only, $143 to $132 an acre more profitable. Another interesting thing, salinity is a problem in that area. But we noticed in this, uh, he had overhead sprinklers, so there's no flooding going on here but we saw a 47% reduction in soil sodium content in all three profiles that we measured, zero to 15 centimeters, 15 to 30 and 30 to 45 centimeters. So it's all kinds of improvements start to be, become realized when you bring the biology back. And I, I haven't been on Howard's farm here, but we've got some customers in Cochise, so just on the other side of that valley and they were pointing out where this is at. That's tough soils. That's that's yeah. not good farm ground. It's terrible soil yeah. and it's terrible water to boot. Um, but it seems to do good in these southwestern farms. We're branching out a little more, trying to get a few more projects to see how it will do. Uh, somebody asked where does sodium go? Well, mm. it's not. I don't think it's being leached because water is so expensive there. They're very frugal with their water resources. Mm -hmm. and they don't get a lot of rain. Mm -hmm. We do see the possibility that maybe the organisms are opening the soil up more, might be getting more um, diffusion down through the soil. Awesome. But, but what we noticed in the composting process, which FDA said, do something good with dairy manure because it was very saline. And that was our first uh, compost bioreactor was using one, one third input material was from the dairy cow manure. And, uh, what tell them about it. So in a windrow composting process, the compost gets more saline. And they had concluded in their research that compost was bad for soils. In the static process, where you allow the fungal community to predominate, we saw a reduction in that sodium. Now, it wasn't being leached through the pile because I put, wasn't putting enough water to leach it. And it didn't stratify in the reactor either. Uh, we're seeing that maybe it's being tied up. Uh, there is a process, fungi secrete oxalic acid, oxalic acid forms oxalates and oxalates tie up positive metal ions. We're suggesting maybe there's a possibility that this uh, sodium is being tied up in, a, in an oxalic oxalate form. Do you, do you think that can happen with other heavy metal contaminants as well? I wouldn't put it past biology to be able to do most of <laughs> Yeah, I, I don't know for sure, but man, she's got some amazing tools. Yeah. If you just allow her to work. We'd have loved to have the resource to do that <laughs> experiment, but so far we haven't had that. <laughs> <laughs> you know, we've got all kinds of microbes to break down all these pesticides and herbicides that we apply. Uh, it's just amazing when you, when you look at the community and what microbes start to dominate. Uh, I see almost every chemical that man has come up with, nature has a way to break it down. Yeah. If you just have the whole community structure there, 
to allow it to work. You've got to have all the workers. It's like a factory. Mm -hmm. You know, if somebody's not there or doesn't show up that day, that that line stops. Mm -hmm. It's the same thing in the soil. Yeah. And we, there's a ton of questions coming. So we're, we're going to have to jump to <laughs> questions fine. here soon. But but before we get there, I, I'm just you. You talked about um, about a one third of it is dairy manure. At least when you started, what what's the other two thirds of what you put in that initial compost load? Oh, it was uh, hay, leaves, straw. But what we're finding, it doesn't matter. Uh, we've had I've done principal component analysis on compost made in Australia, uh, looking at two commercial products that are vermicompost there, plus one made in my bioreactor with uh, eucalyptus leaves. You know, and twigs. We don't, we don't have those here. Yeah. I make mine out of either spoiled hay or alfalfa or leaves, because uh, I want as much product. I, I use wood chips at the beginning because I needed to reduce the density of the pile since I had dairy manure. I, I don't suggest it. Um, you get more material if you, if you use something that can be broken down. But when I did the analysis, there was no difference in the end product in both the microbial population and the functionality, uh, the, the messenger RNA that were being transcribed in that system. Principal compound analysis put all of those right on top of each other. So. Mm -hmm allowing this process to mature and come full cycle. It seems like here's, there's an end product that's similar with, with, with compost made this way. That's, that's super interesting that it, that it uh, doesn't. And, and it's encouraging to know that we don't have to have the perfect formula, get the carbon out there and let the guys go to work is basically yeah. what you're saying. Yeah, and, and when I first started, I found microbes that were first discovered in the Antarctic Arctic, pelagic bacteria here in Las Cruces, New Mexico. And trust me, we don't have that kind of a budget to import <laughs> fancy stuff. <laughs> <laughs> oh, goodness, goodness. Well, we usually don't start questions this early, but they're just flooding in here. So okay. we're, we're going to get okay. going. So Randy asked how the Howard Buffett farm test went. I think we've already answered that one uh, extremely well, extremely well. So that's great. Uh, Edward is asking, is there a way to determine if the mold that forms on spent ground coffee beans that he's trying to compost, uh, is there a way to determine if the mold that forms on spent ground coffee beans that I'm trying to compost, is, is that a good mold or a bad mold? Uh, if, if it's being broken down by nature, most likely it's a good mold. But, but we don't know, we have not tried coffee bean or spent coffee bean grounds yet. And they do have to be mindful about um, the, the amount of moisture content because it, it will have tendency to be too wet. Mm -hmm. So they might have to mix it with something else. Yeah, yeah. just keep that in mind as you're building it. Yeah. 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 And, and I, I would say that when you build the, uh, our compost bioreactor, that after you build it properly, don't skip any steps. I hated to have you at 12 months later just to fail. I didn't get to skip any. Okay, so you don't need And but the thing about it is if you have it done, if you have it right, that nothing should grow out of it. It's such an aggressive environment with all the microbes and that eventually you have all these microosopods in there and with the worms. And so you shouldn't have anything grow out of it. It kills just about or you know, digest or eaten, the, the seeds are eaten by all those or, organisms, uh, except maybe tomato seed. <laughs> yeah, but, those will survive. <laughs> but if you have something grow out of it, that means that something might have gone wrong because you have let it uh, dry it up too much or something like that. Mm -hmm. But from time to time, you will see some mold or, oh, or mushrooms all grow of out of it. We've seen mushrooms at the top. We've seen uh, a mushroom that was discovered by Pasteur that nobody's seen for since he discovered it. <laughs> it's been bizarre. That's incredible. Yeah. So yeah. the mushrooms type of thing that, that grow from time to time, that's okay. Make, make sure the pile can breathe. Make sure it gets oxygen. And everything goes from there. You know, 
it's just, you don't want it too dense. The coffee grounds probably too dense. You need to mix some roughage in there. Yeah, yeah. Okay. Uh, Frank is asking, and this is a great question, what happens to the worms at the end of the process? Do you screen them out and reuse them or do you just leave them in and let them become part of it? Well, you'll see in the extraction process, uh, by the way, you can go get all of this at California State University, Chico, at their Center for Regenerative Ag and Resilient Systems. There's a whole page of all the different things, how to make the extractor, how to make the compost. There's one section there on citizen scientists that have shown some of the bizarre results from applying this. Uh, one in Australia, the uh, ranch manager sprayed it on one side of a chestnut tree. And that side of the chestnut tree leafed out a full month ahead of the rest on the other side. And it looked like a tree without a trunk. And the chestnuts on that were twice as big as the chestnuts on the other side of the tree. So again, bizarre things. Uh, <laughs> but as far as the worms goes that, no, we don't screen our worms, no. but you can do that for your next batch because it's like a worm farm. There will be a lot of worms, uh, so many more than what, what you start out with. Well, when you're, when you're making the extract, you're putting it, uh, all the material into a screen and spraying it and stirring it. And many of them will survive. I just save all the, the material that doesn't go through that screen into another bucket and the worms are usually in that. Uh, and, then some, that and, and that becomes part of your next batch then. Yeah, yeah. But many of them are sacrificed. Well, they'll 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 make more. So yeah, that's what I was going to say. <laughs> uh, several people asking about the cold weather question. Uh, you're saying you don't want to let it freeze, but is there a certain temperature where you'd be better off just bringing it inside anyway, just just to have a higher ambient temperature to speed things up? Uh, I think uh, as long as you don't let it freeze, you're good. The more consistent the temperature is, the faster it's going to mature. Uh, inside is good. Uh, we've seen many different ways to do it. You, you might be able to put hay bales around it and a heat tape at the bottom if you're a really cold climate. Mm -hmm. uh, but leave the top, you know, double plastic on the top for solar insulation. We've seen a one hoop house in Colorado do a 40 by 40 reactor. And they got down to 32 degrees internal temperature, but when they pulled it open, the worms were still active. So uh, we've, ours has gone through minus 16 degrees Fahrenheit for three days, never above zero and survived fine. But it's a freakish event though. Yeah. But um, otherwise we're relatively warm here in the winter. Yeah. yeah. But, but people could move it inside if they needed to. Yes. Yeah. We've seen yeah. dairy farmers move it in with their cows. Their cows keep it heated. Mm -hmm. uh, if you have a root cellar, I think that would be the ideal. Yeah. You know, that to have that constant temperature. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Uh, so here's another great question Adam is asking How long are the organisms viable in the extract after you make that extract? Of course, I'd recommend using it as soon as possible. Um, I haven't ever really pushed the envelope to find out. We've had some observations in Australia of a farmer that left it for uh, three months and, you know, in the shade, and it still was effective on, on their planting. But that's just secondhand information yeah. that we have no way of verify that. And so in to ensure that everything is viable and that you have all the species that come from your compost, that they are staying viable, I would suggest that you use it as soon as possible. Uh, at this point, we haven't had the resource to um, do the further tests and on that yet. And so um, that would be something would be nice to verify, but you know, it, it takes a little bit to, to do the testing on that. And mm -hmm. if you have left, leftover compost, all I do is put it in a smaller bioreactor and I put hay on the top and I put a drip system to keep it wet. And the worms will, will consume that and keep the pile opened up. Yeah. Uh, you also use a piece of uh, same material to cover the top part of your bioreactor if you do make one. Uh, that way, 
that it keeps the moisture content constant. It helps keep it constant like that, but also keeps the wildlife from getting in there or, you know, neighborhood cats or something like that. Get in there. Bobcats like these pots. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that's that's crazy. Have have you ever had people that uh, you know in the process of making this compost? Have you ever had people actually plant like cover crops in it and have living roots going at the same time? It's a big no no. <laughs> okay. We suggest we suggest not. Yeah. Uh, if they're looking for the mycorrhizal fungi, what we noticed in the soils that we applied this to, and there's no mycorrhizal fungi in this. You know, since you don't have a plant root, you won't have any associated. Right. It, it's, it's, it's other fungi. Right. Yeah. And we noticed where we did put the compost, we saw 23 species of mycorrhizae come and flourish. So I, I think it's more you're developing the community for them to come and thrive in. Okay. They're there. They're, they're, they're everywhere. Yeah. Mycorrhizal fungi, you need those living roots. So this is a different process and different environment so the don't jump too far ahead you want to incubate all those organisms first and take them to inoculate your land with your seeds or or with plants already have living roots in the ground and that way they can work together it's, it's kind of like build it and they will come gotcha and, and also your cover crops the multi-species cover crops are instrumental in that too Yep. Yep. So yeah, build it and you'll come. I really like that. Uh, several people asking questions about how to get this uh, in either people are asking, can you make a slurry and put this on your seed and let it dry as kind of a seed treatment? Have you had people run it through uh, like a foliar application through a sprayer or even through a, through center pivots? Can you do any or all of those? Uh, all of those uh, are, our number one recommended way is to make the extract and inject it into the furrow plant. And we've seen the best results there. Okay. Uh, and see contact is very important. Don't just, that's why we say in furrow. So that way, when you inject it in furrow, that, that you have the seed contact. Mm -hmm. and, uh, seed coating, we really recommend if you're, to make a slurry uh, and use about a quarter of that for a 50 pound bag and tumble those seeds. And we really recommend to plant them down if you can. Uh, drying, uh, you don't need to. Actually, actually, the seeds flow pretty well when they're damp. But a, a project in Belgium did that with their cover crop seeds, and they saw twice the productivity of mm -hmm. the cover crop with the uh, seed inoculated. And let's see, what was... Um, center pivot? Center pivot. I, I think you could put it through a center pivot. Uh, what we see is you need a living root if you're gonna do a, a topical application. And uh, that's- don't, Yeah, don't put that on bare ground. No, yeah. no, it, you need to have a living root. And as far as foliar, oh, definitely. This stuff's amazing uh, for taking care of diseases, foliar diseases. Uh, I used it on my tomatoes. Uh, when they started to get a wilt, it went away. I had a, uh, all my cottonwood trees were weeping from a fungal infection, I took the compost and spread it on the weeping areas. It, they completely dried up and the trees don't show any more weeping uh, of fluids anymore. Uh, Just make sure that if they are going to run it through the center pivot, afterwards, clean it out really well because these are microorganisms and they, they can develop uh, the, the um, biofilm. More for, for drip system. I wouldn't yeah. recommend it in a drip system because you more oh, okay. to form a biofilm. Yeah. But yeah. overhead uh, pivots, yeah, that, that's a pretty good size orifice and you're yeah. not going to be, this is all screened through a paint strainer, a five gallon pail paint strainer. I think it's about 200 mesh. Uh, so that way it doesn't clog up your injectors on a, a tractor when you're doing injection. Yeah, the spray tips and stuff. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah. Uh, Joseph is asking, have you ever gone microbe hunting to try to increase the diversity of your starting population? When I first started, yeah, I, I went to the mountains. I, I grabbed duff out of the forest there and 
uh, any place that I could find decaying organic matter, I would put it into the pile. But make sure that it's the decay organic matter above ground. Don't yeah. try to grab the dirt. Don't, no soil. No soil in the compost. And you know, when you uh, process this material before you put it in the bioreactor, it goes through a water bath and you're tromping on it. Uh, all the rocks, all the soil settles out of the system. And all you're getting into this bioreactor is organic matter, which is what you want. Mm -hmm. So you don't want any soil in there at all? No. I, I, what the soil does is it, it, it clogs it up. It doesn't let it breathe properly. Again, mm -hmm. oxygen is, is key to this system. And anytime you block it, either uh, putting uh, wet grass in there or green leaves, you know, all this really should be uh, right up, material up. that's dried before. And then you just re-wet it. And you're only wetting it for about 40 seconds, yeah. just enough to get a surface coating. And once the pile starts heating up and steaming, it water penetrates everything and you, you have that film and there are traversing across that film of water. Yeah, so even even like feedlot manure, you have to be careful because sometimes if they're pushing it out of the lot and they get too much dirt, you'd have to be kind of careful about that. Yeah. That and uh, you don't want any cow patties or horse apples in it. You need to break this material up. You need as much surface area as you can get. If you've got a bale grinder, uh, throw all your material in there and run it through a bale grinder and it's ready to go then. Yeah. Or, we, or a chipper shredder if you don't. We run ours through the chipper shredder. Okay. And just think about, take a step back, think about those dirt, gravel, sand, mineral type of thing. If you are only inoculating your land with a two pound per acre rate, and you ended up with some soil, some sand, dirt, or rocks in that two pounds, you are going to dramatically diminish the amount of micro mm -hmm. in that. You're, you're diluting the effect. Yeah. yeah. Yeah, no, that, that makes sense. Uh, so we got a question here from Willie, uh, kind of one one soil nerd to another here, I think, to you. He <laughs> says, can you elaborate on the soil respiration decreasing at higher microbial biomass associated with increased microbiome? Higher soil respiration always regarded as positively correlated with soil health. Does, does that max out at a certain point? Well, what we notice, uh, and usually the area that they're, the, this test that they're using to figure this out, uh, they're in one part of that curve. They're in that, that linear increase. And they're assuming that as you increase the amount of carbon, increase the amount of microbes, number of microbes, you're going to have more respiration. My research has proven that not to be so. At that point in the beginning, yes, but this thing starts to level out. And you start to get more and more efficient. Uh, I've seen seven times the amount of carbon, uh, 30 times the number of, uh, of the microbial biomass, and only twice the respiration. So if you are... Yeah, it looks like that. At this part of the curve, <laughs> it looks like it's linear, right? But then that means you have not reached that critical point of efficiency. They've never, been, system. they've never been up in that upper range where you have a functioning uh, high carbon uh, fungal dominant system. And I noticed this also in uh, grazing lands over in the Southeast. The exact same thing I observed in the lab and in, in all the field studies I've done here in uh, NMSU, the same thing showed up over there that those people that were adopting what we call an adaptive multi paddock grazing management process actually saw a 30% reduction in respiration, even though they had more microbes and more carbon in their soil. So a lot of these tests are not great. Uh, the PLFA, I am really not a fan of. I, I like visible visual microscopy to assess the microbes that are there. Uh, everything else gets biased. The respiration, I'm not really fond of that where you take that soil, you grind it up, you dry it, you re-wet it, you add some nutrient resource and see what the microbes are doing. You completely destroy that population structure of your soil microbiome. Yet if you do it in situ or, or in the field, that's where you can see what your re real respiration is. And that's where you'll start to see that as you improve the health of your soil, 
that becomes more and more efficient at uh, not respiring so much carbon, but having it go into the soil. I, I use this very uh, kind of dumb ex example that I'm not in shape. You know, I, I'm a thin person, but I am not in shape. If I have to go up to four flights of stairs, I'm huffing and puffing and I can't, don't talk to me for a while. Just let me catch up with my breath, right? We have a couple of friends, they, they are triathletes. I mean, you know, just listen to their activity makes me tired. <laughs> they can run up four flights of stairs and then they are hopping around like, where are we going next? You know, what are we gonna do? And they're just breathing normally and they, because their system is so much more efficient. They are in shape. They are, they, they are, their muscles, their, their microbes in their body, their, everything is so in, so in at that level compared to my is down there that I'm more sedentary in compared to them. And so, so, you know, you cannot compare to like, okay, well, full flights of stairs is a lot for a lot of people to run up. Well, there are some people that are in very good shape. They can run up there and still run marathon. So um, that's why when you say respiration, the, the, the more you produce, the more you respire. Yes, you will still respire more, but the rate is not the same. The rate of respiration will be lower for, for a function, very well functioning system. Yeah, yeah, good stuff. Uh, just maybe one or two more questions. We're already over time, but this is this is really great stuff. Uh, interesting question here. Uh, uh, this is coming from uh, Ecuador, uh, actually. When you start filling your bioreactor, do you need to fill it all at the same time, or can you continue to add other stuff on top of it to be worked into it? What's your recommendation there? We recommend getting all the material ready to fill one bioreactor and doing it in, if you can do it in a day, uh, if it tails into the second day, but you want, since you know that you have to wait a year, you want to, don't want to delay the filling of this and you would like to have the whole bioreactor start to process at once instead of having a heating phase and then going down, putting in more, having a heating phase, then go down. You want to get the, the heating phase lasts about four days. Keep in mind mm -hmm. this is different from the, the other type of uh composting process. This is fully aerobic from very beginning to the end. And also you're building a system. As soon as you, you're putting the stuff in there, the, all the action starts. They are starting all this adjusting process and microbial uh, activities and everything start happening. So every time when you add more to it, then you are resetting it. And you add a more, you're resetting it. So there are different timelines there. So this is really the type of the process you need to do it all at once. Yeah. Your favorite material, if you have food waste, I dry mine uh, under a glass, piece of glass, and I just collect it and then I run it all through the chipper shredder and can put it into the pile that way. Yeah, get it all going. So I know that, uh, so last question here, this is a question of scale. You, you showed the picture of the bioreactor, you know, that you say you put about a ton of material in, I think, and it cooks down to 700. Mm -hmm. I know that uh, you, you referenced the big project in Colorado. I think Patrick O'Neill and those guys mm -hmm. were behind that very large scale one, which can be done. I don't want to get into that if people have questions about how to do this on a large scale, shoot me an email and I can put you in contact with some people that have done it. What's, what's the smallest scale that you've seen people do this at? You know, if I could say home gardener, they don't need 700 pounds of finished product. How small a scale can you go to with this and still make it work? You, it's very basic concept is that if you have like one foot of material like this, you need to have the, the, the beginning point where the air can start penetrating and infiltrate through. So let's say if you want to make a smaller one, 
you can probably make a, uh, let's say two and a half feet diameter and then put a six inch pipe in the middle, right? And then you can make that kind of cylinder and then you can pull out the pipe after one day and using the same material, just design it smaller. So that way the air infiltration is still there. So you're not gonna have a dead zone and become anaerobic. Mm -hmm. And then you can, you can adjust the amount of water that you put in there and then still keeping it at the roughly around 70% moisture content. You're never gonna have enough of this, even if you're a small farmer. <laughs> I'll tell you that right now. Uh, you can grow straight into it. Uh, it, it does fantastic. Uh, you coating, putting it on your garden. You know, there's so many uses for this. So. Yeah, so don't be afraid of making too much. But 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 the key is is the principle of having it fully aerated so it doesn't go anaerobic, and then keeping the proper moisture, uh, and, and then you know temperature. A smaller a smaller one is going to be more susceptible to freezing. I'm assuming because it's just not generating the heat too. Yeah. You know, so and, and worms. Don't forget the worms. Yeah. Don't forget the worms. Yeah, can't can't forget the worms for sure. And, that, and we also um, have some people that they don't want it as tall because it's harder for them to fill. So you can make them shorter as well. Mm -hmm. So there are different ways to do it if you don't need as much product at the end. But it just you you do have to adhere to some of the principles. Yeah. So again, we didn't get into a lot of the architecture of how to build it, but but there's great resources out there. Uh, you mentioned the Chico State resources. Uh, you so just go to YouTube, search for Johnson Sioux compost bioreactor. If you Google it, you'll, I, I did that earlier and the Chico state uh, stuff comes up really well. So tons of good resources. If you can't find this stuff, send me an email and I can help put you in contact with the right uh, websites or the right links. Uh, Keith at greencoverseed.com. You can get a hold of me and uh, we can get you those resources, but fantastic information, uh, David, uh, Wei Chen, that's just great stuff. Pretty good stuff for a contractor and a real estate agent, actually. <laughs> <laughs> you know, that, that's a great thing about this country. I think I am I am a an immigrant, naturalized citizen back in the early 80s. And what I love about this country is that if you try hard enough, you get a second chance or third chance or fourth chance. Mm -hmm. You have to be curious, willing to work hard. And, and, and people are so receptive and most times so generous. And that's why our belief is to put all this information online somewhere that making open source for everybody yeah. to try it because the, the ingenuity of the people here, it's amazing that they can, they can experiment on things that maybe they come up with something better. Yeah. and share with everybody and we all move forward together in the right direction yeah yeah yeah, <laughs> yeah you know that you're you're exactly right uh wave chin that, that this country is great that way and i've really been appreciative of the people within the you know and people in agriculture in general but the people within the regenerative ag soil health movement are very, very sharing. You know, they're not they're not holding these secrets because I want to be better than you. People are very generous about this information, and, and you guys would be at, at the at the top of that list. So we appreciate the generosity of your time. We've gone almost 15 minutes over, but hardly anybody's <laughs> dropped off because it's been such good stuff. Thank you so very much, uh, folks. Uh, next week, uh, Dale Strickler is going to be on. Uh, Dale has got his third book published. It's called uh, Restoring Your Soil, The Complete Guide to Restoring Your Soil. Uh, so make sure that you're on and you can listen to Dale talk about uh, all the things that are in that book. Uh, and uh, then in two weeks, we'll have Dr. Richard Mulvaney talking about uh, uh, how fertilizer recommendations are way overblown from universities. It'll, it'll play right into what you're talking about here as well, because it's all biologically driven. So it's all going to fit together really well. Happy Thanksgiving, everybody. Thanks for joining. Again, David, uh, Wave Chin, thank you so much for giving us uh, your time. And uh, thank, you too. thank you for the opportunity to share with everybody and thank 
everybody who's growing something for us to eat. I mean, for this Thanksgiving holiday, I love Thanksgiving and I love to eat. And thank you for growing things for us to feed us. <laughs> All right. Take care, everybody. Thank you. Happy thank Thanksgiving. You.